Reinventing our cities and re-enchanting the world. Who gets a say in deciding where they live, and what if more of us did? This week, we visit with Mary Miss, a Guggenheim Fellow and celebrated artist whose organization, the City as Living Laboratory, strives to empower regular people to create not the cliché of the sustainable city, but of living and breathing cities of sustenance, she says. Then we speak to scholars Silvia Federici and Peter Leinbar about the promises of commoning for our environment and our social health. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. How could the artist's imagination help make issues more accessible to people? To recognize artists as not just the icing on the cake, the thing that is always disposed of first, but really essential members of a conversation. Mary, we're connecting with you here in your studio in Tribeca. When did you move in here? I moved in in 1970. I lived around the corner in an old herring factory. When we moved in down here, there were spice and coffee and cheese companies all over. Uh, there was a butter company across the street. Uh, there were uh, cheese fumes not always nicely coming in our back window. It's completely <laughs> transformed around yeah. here. Do you yes. feel like you have any say no. in that? No, I did not have any <laughs> say. I do not know where I, where I live anymore. I can't get down the street because there are so many baby carriages. It's a totally different place. Were you always driven by this sense of how do you reconnect a people to its place? Was that a driving influence for you? It was really important and I think that's what ended up separating me and my work early on from the land artists because they were willing to go out in the desert and build something. And what really interested me was more about what a person experiences and how you engage people with places and structures and their own environment. We call ourselves a laboratory, City is Living Laboratory, because we're interested in testing how you engage people. So that's what got us out walking the corridor of Broadway. 5.5 million people per day ride the subway. It's the largest shared urban infrastructure. This is Red Square. It's an apartment building that was um, built at the fall of communism. The estimate's one to 10 birds per die a year uh, per building and there's about a million buildings in New York City. So we started doing walks with artists and scientists and every one of these green tags represents an artist scientist walk or talk that has happened. So we've done almost 50 of these. So we've really been investigating the whole corridor, but now our attention is really focusing up here on uh, Van Cortlandt Park, starting at Van Cortlandt Park and going down to the Harlem River. This is really an interesting project. Every time it rains, even a little bit, this area floods all along Broadway. The basements flood, people's uh, businesses flood. And part of that is happening because there's a brook called Tippett's Brook that comes into Van Cortlandt Lake. It's from a watershed that goes up into Westchester County. And in the early teens of the 20th century, the water was put into the sewer, the Broadway sewer. So the sewer line goes under Broadway, cuts across, and finally goes into the Harlem River. But there are about four to five million gallons of water a day that go into the sewer. So it ends up going in as sewage into the Harlem River. And it's one of the worst polluters of the Harlem River. So people have talked for a long time about how it might be possible to daylight Tibbetts Brook, and that means letting it see the light of day, taking it out of the sewer. 
So the Friends are a nonprofit organization that does environmental education and stewardship programs in Van Cortlandt Park. The Friends and other groups have been talking about daylighting to this brook for a while and we have a coalition. For me personally, it was looking at where the brook goes into the sewer and kind of going, questioning, like, wait, where does this water go? And why is this clean water going into the city sewer system? You don't think about what happens when I take a shower, what happens when I flush a toilet to that water. You just know the city takes care of it and all's good on your end. But unfortunately, the city's not taking care of all of it. Parks Department has been on board with daylighting for many, many years now. Uh, we are slowly getting DEP to be on board. And the main issue for them has always been, well, the city doesn't own the property, so it probably can't happen. But the solutions that they've come up for dealing with this are absolutely horrible. They're horrendous. It's like, oh, we'll just build these huge catch basins at the northern end of the park and they can hold the water. And it's like, well, no, those are forest. You're not going to take down our trees and just put in concrete basins to hold water. That's not a good solution. Oh, we'll change the level of the lake. We'll, you know, increase, we'll decrease the depth of the lake. Well, then you're opening up all the shorelines for Phragmites and other invasives. Not a good solution. You need to come up with a good solution. And daylighting is the only good solution for the environment as a whole. So we don't have to feel limited when we imagine what the daylighting of Tibbetts Creek can be, because we know they may have, right, they may have built it over the river. It doesn't mean it can't reemerge. As the city as a living lab has been really great as as far as getting the word out about the project, getting more people informed, we have our limited reach and our focus has really been on the environmental aspects of it. The more people that are aware of it, it will help raise it to a level of priority for the city to do. Then we can show that more people support it and this is what everybody wants. We're imagining that there could be a sound wall between the highway and the corridor itself and that there could be an elevated pathway and then that the stream could run down that corridor. People could actually have access to nature and not just a highway. So one of the things that we're doing yep. is trying to find ways to draw attention. One of our most interesting projects was an artist named Bob Brain who did temporary tattoos that he hand painted onto people people would line up, they could not wait to have this done. Are they tracing the track of Tibbetts Brook? Yes, yeah, so it's showing the original track, which you can see here. Here's what it used to be. Now it's in the Broadway sewer, and here's where we want it to be along the, uh, you know, Major Deacon. Like we were proposing this as one of our projects, and one of our board members said, isn't that a little weird? Actually, it turned out to be the, like the most impactful thing that we've done as a project, pro practically. The impulse behind this came out of my decades of working in the public realm, because that's where all my work has been done. But it's really difficult to have access. And I wanted to try to imagine a way that artists would be recognized as being able to have an essential complementary role at the table when issues come up in the city. And what difference do artists make in those conversations? I think it's really about the kind of emotional, uh, sensual, psychological uh, aspects of art that give people something to relate to. I, I'm imagining that this corridor of Broadway that I'm looking at now and have been for a number of years, that in another 20 or 30 years, it could be really transformed. This could become the corridor that looks at different social structures, different ecological structures, where it's, it's this rich environment instead of one that's just kind of a, a drain on uh, the people who live nearby in their busy lives where they're every, all of us are just running all the time. How do you begin to let their lives echo around them? For people that have come to New York, they might be familiar with one of the pieces that really has changed our landscape, and that's down at the, in Battery Park, um, South Cove. Can you tell us what your project was, what the idea was, what was the problem you were trying to solve there? Oh, the problem was that I'd been living in this neighborhood by the river since 1970 and we couldn't get to the river. So I wanted to do something that would really 
give people the water, that you would hear it, that you would smell it, that you would get down close to it. So we, you know, made it so that the walkway uh, ramps down, uh, that uh, there's a visual connection between the land and the water because I had these pilings put in that are reminiscent in a way of the old pilings that used to be there. We did this planting of what you might have found along the edge of the river in an, at an earlier period. Since it's nearby, I go regularly and I get to see the change of seasons there. And I get to see the way people interact with it. It's not to say, oh, look at this, look at me, I, I'm influencing everything. It's more to say, yes, artists can really have an, a, an important role, which is the thing that got me to start Cydia's Living Lab. Community has to be intended, not as a gated reality, a grouping of people joined by exclusive interests and separating them from others, but rather as a quality of relations, a principle of cooperation and of responsibility to each other and the health of the forests, the seas, the animals. So writes Silvia Federici. But how can we get there from here? The practice of commoning and the idea that we might hold and manage land and assets together in common holds a lot of appeal these days. To help us think forward, as we do on the show, we have two world-renowned experts on commoning in the house. Silvia Federici's latest books are Witches, Witch Hunting and Women and Reenchanting the World, Feminism and the Politics of the Commons. It's forward is written by historian and Laura Flanders show favorite, Peter Leinbaugh, who is the author of, among other classics, the Magna Carta Manifesto. I am overjoyed and feel tremendously lucky to have the two of you together in studio. Let's talk about the role of the commons in American history. I, I was just, I spent some time during the election, election season in Appalachia mm -hmm. and heard a lot about the Appalachian commons, about which I knew very little. It is often told the story of the commons as if it was in just medieval England, um, but that's not the case. Peter, you've looked at this history. What's American about it? Yeah, what's American about it is, unlike Europe, America, American capitalism is born in destruction of the commons. In Europe, we used to be taught European capitalism was born on the destruction of feudalism. Actually, as we go further, we see that this destruction of the commons is all over. But in Appalachia in particular, this has been a zone of freedom, like, and the latest to be privatized, with the mountaintop removals, the destructions of mountains, the pollutions of rivers, has produced the opposite in ideological terms. That is, th this was the zone that elected JFK, if you remember, in 1960, <clears throat> the Kennedy. This was where poverty was discovered. What's actually happening in Appalachia are communities over many generations that have been multi-ethnic, have been Native American, been African American, been runaway slaves. It's freedom land. It's no accident that John Brown centered the struggle for abolition in Appalachia, in the mountains. But now it's the land of monoculture, huge landowners, coal mining companies that have very little concern for the community or the, or the planet. Um, jump to here, we've got an urban tradition of commoning here in the United yes. States too. What does that look like to you and, and how do we bring this picture together as something alive today? Well, I think what is alive today is that more and more people are being displaced. They have been displaced from rural areas, they have been displaced from the mountains that have been destroyed. But at the same time, to the extent that they have been forced to urbanize, they also bring to the urban space, right, the need to reconstitute a community. And we have seen it in the United States, I think, in the last uh, uh, three, four decades in particular, and also thanks to immigrant people you know, who come from the south of the continent, where you still have strong communitarian relations, you still have strong indigenous, you know, group, population, nation, who have a lot of communal territory still. And so we have seen, for example, the phenomenon of the urban garden, 
agricultural farming, which are much more, you know, the sources of, uh, you know, food, and they have really become centers of sociality mm. and also places where for new production of knowledge, like children from school can go there and see how, you know, vegetables are grown. And uh, so they are, they are fulfilling now many, many different functions. So this is part, urban gardens are part of the re-enchanting yes. of the title yes. of your book. Very much so. Very yes. enchanting. Give us some background. You mentioned it in the foreword, what that word, that phrase is about. Yeah, the fr <laughs> it comes from French for chanter, uh, so to, meaning to sing. So to enchant is, is an action of joy, and it's an action of, of hope, of the imagination. That's enchantment. It's not um, just for Halloween or for a senior prom. It's not just... You're not just to up. sell albums. <laughs> not just to sell albums. Or no, it's crazy. to reconceive of what we are on the planet. We're, our planet is not real estate. Our planet is not a jail to throw people off of. It's not a wilderness. It can be a home. And as Sylvia just said in this great book, Reenchanting the World, we have to make a home with one another and practice principles of reciprocity redistribution, obligation, and respect. To enchant is to sing into community once again. So what has feminism got to, have, got to do with all of this, Sylvia? I think a lot, because I, I think today women are really on the front line in terms of recreating commons. And in particular, one of the things that's been happening is the commoning of reproductive activities. And I just came back from a 40 days trip through Latin America. And that's a place where you can really see it in the most uh, ex intense form. I've been, I visited a number of what they call Villa Miserias. These are encampments that people displaced from rural area have created in urban territory, in the periphery. And they've all been built with, by people's hands. So when I'm saying reproduction, for example, you know, I've been in communities where now women are doing a lot of uh, reconstruction of the day-to-day -day activities that are producing people's life with the popular kitchen, collective kitchen, uh, urban gardens, uh, also organizing network of activities in a cooperative way. For example, I was in a place called Vija 2124th in Buenos Aires, where it, amazingly, women are organizing to take care of bringing the children to school, bringing them back to school because they are afraid they may be run over by a car, where they take care, the, the state is totally absent. So they take care of uh, the garbage. They take care of uh, making sure that people have some food if, uh, if they are extremely poor. So how so do we there's not a fall, whole network. But how do we not fall, Sylvia, into the trap of having women do the yeah. same old traditional low-paid, low-respected work? Okay, you may say that. On the other hand, what is happening, so it's not an attempt to uh, replace the state, but it's a way of providing for the most immediate need in a cooperative way, but in the process also something new is being created. Mm. You know, new forms of solidarity are being created. New ways of imagining how reproduction could be organized. Mm -hmm. And because of the solidarity that is generated, women are also gaining the power to confront the state, to negotiate with a different level of power. So how does this change Marxism, Peter? So the, I mean, the, the commons the, the is, really the commons is not only a place of redistribution and of resources, it's also a place of resistance. This is the lesson of Standing Rock, just thinking of North America. And the kitchens in Standing Rock, the care of the children, the care of the elderly, those who provided clothes, those who enchanted the land with their notions of its sacredness and the purity of the water, the water protectors, were led by women, mm -hmm. young women a new generation. So there's new leadership and there's perhaps new appreciation, new valuing mm -hmm. of certain kinds of work. Is there also a shift in our sites of struggle? 100 years ago, 200 years ago, it was the, the, the factory floor, mm -hmm. the, 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 the physical production of stuff. 
um, was the place of struggle. Now many of us work nowhere near a factory floor. Mm -hmm. uh, and these issues of our lives seem to me increasingly the places of our struggle. Absolutely. This is where, in fact, you know, most of the feminist uh, and particularly more generally women's activity is now, you know, uh, engaging uh, the reconstitution of the social fabric the with uh, centering on the reorganization of reproduction in a way that does not isolate us any longer. I was just thinking of Michelle Obama and her gardens. I mean, this is, uh, this is a signal. She is responding to needs that are being felt all over the world. Water and food, and then housing. We have to find ways of working with one another, not to replace the state or instead of the state. The commons is neither the market nor the state. It's a way of survival, and it's a way of renewing forms of cooperation, forms of value with our differences of sex, race, gender. Because it requires us to talk to one another, among other things. Occupy did, yeah. Standing Rock does. I'm also looking at what's happening in Argentina, what's happening in Brazil, what's happening in this country. And we're seeing the rejection of all things common, the, the increasing isolation and clinging to private mm -hmm. industry, the begging of Amazon, please, please, please come, we'll give you public money. Um, so what's happening here? It's not all like, not everyone's as impressed as, as we are perhaps. But I, I, my view is that this move to the right and uh, it's uh, very much a response to also the level and intensity of struggle that people are making. Uh, again, when you look in particular and to the South American continent, you see that there is almost no place where people are not fighting mm -hmm. to defend what they have, to defend their territory, to defend their land. And uh, I think the move to the Bolsonaros, you know, the Macri, are really a response to that. And right now also, you have a new women's movement, a new very, very powerful women's movement, which is in the street, not only for the struggle over abortion or against uh, violence against women, but the more and more, you know, moving around, mobilizing around the broader program that connects violence against women to the politics of extractivism, to the destruction by mining company of the land and the waters, and uh, who sees very much the question of producing your commons, mm. rebuilding the commons. I was thinking you don't need just to go to Latin America, though <coughs> here in New York, one thinks of the Longhouse and the Odenosone people uh, as a source of inspiration. These are the people who built New York after all, the, the Mohawk high iron folks. But I was also thinking of the so-called birthplace of democracy in Greece and the Greek common. The Greek commoning has been on the forefront, the edge of the massacres of our basis of reproduction, of health, of education, of housing with the neoliberal onslaught that paved the way for Trump, that paved the way for the rise of fascist creatures in, mm. in the halls of uh, power. What would you say that we should keep our eyes on? What are you watching um, as you look at the landscape out there for, for, for green shoots, for bright sparks, for commoning? Oh, there's so many. I mean, the young people especially. Uh, that's what I look to. And I, I see new attitudes, no longer formed by the Cold War, but formed by these experiences, which to you and me may seem new, but to them are natural. Again, Occupy, Standing Rock, the Zapatistas. These are places where attempts have been made and defeats have occurred. But with defeat, the memory keepers mm. keep it alive. I'll ask you the same question, Sylvia, but I will throw out the thought that I didn't mention at the beginning, which is we've just seen a midterm election where it seemed to me ironic that you have kind of the, the bastion of capital, mm -hmm. the US electoral system, running its operations off an incredible off a project of commoning. 
with people in the election campaigns that I saw all across this country working together, sharing resources, sharing lists, sharing information, giving car rides, helping people to the polls. It's not your typical commoning project, but it is one of a kind, isn't it? But I think it's an understanding. It's the understanding I was referring to, and Pete I was referring to, that commoning is not only a reorganization of the production, it's also the building of a ground of resistance. Yeah. Without, you know, you, you, every, every struggle, every form of mobilization, you know, requires its own forms of, of yeah. reproduction that sustains it. And uh, the coming together of people, you know, building new ties of solidarity, this is what allows, gives continuity to a struggle. This is what allows it to really in intensify. All right, so if people want to learn more about commoning and our two extraordinary authors here, you can get more information about uh, both Peter Leinbaugh and Silvia Feder Federici's books at our website. What a pleasure. Thank you both. Really, Thanks to you. I'm an honor to be with you. Thanks. Thank you.